Hello, Embassy, Embassy family. It is great to introduce Dave Riddell and really honoured to have you with us today. Oh, it's, a, it's quite it's a, quite exciting. Now, unfortunately, here's an unfortunate thing. Uh, yesterday, when I was doing some sprint training, I actually pulled my hamstring a little bit, but otherwise I was keen to give Dave a race because he's... Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, he's the fastest... Uh, old, I don't, old man. Yeah, they, it's, okay, it's okay to say old man. The fastest old man in Australasia. Oh, yes. Uh, that was fun. So you just recently competed in... Queensland, yeah, for that title. 400 metres. Yep. I had a bunch of Aussies chasing me pretty hard. Excellent. Various uh, people from around the Pacific Islands. That was fun. Yeah. But I've been preparing for that race for a year or so, so they, what chance did they have? Excellent. Yeah, we're down here, ready to run the Kepler. Yes, yeah, so uh, <laughs> on Saturday, Dave is going to be running the, the Kepler race, which is a 60 kilometer race through the mountains, which is crazy. Absolutely so, good stuff. Uh, it's going to be a sodden race at the rate we go, and she's pretty wet down Yeah, here. it's very wet down here in Fjordland at the moment. But it's great to have everyone here, and today in this video, we will be going through one of the rarest teachings in the world, I think. And it's called the fraught journey to heterosexuality. And I've never heard anyone touch on this topic before. And I've never heard anyone bring such profound content that brings so much real clear understanding around uh, sexual orientation, which is a huge deal in our world. It sure is. We are facing a crisis in masculinity in the Western world today yeah. that has gone undiagnosed, untreated, and very few counsellors are really addressing it competently. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a topic that if you want to address this, you can find yourself facing a lot of persecution, institutional persecution and all sorts. Um, before we jump into that too much, uh, I just want to introduce you a little bit more. How many hours, just off the top of your head, would you say you've had in I tell professional people my, my, my apprenticeship so far is uh, pushing 60,000 hours. And um, as a result of that, I nearly know what I'm doing. That's great. <laughs> so if you want a counsellor who nearly knows what he's doing, <laughs> and, uh, and if you can get a booking, because usually when you open up your bookings for three or six months, how quickly do they go, do those sessions go? Oh, in a few days, yeah. There's a, there's a few sessions left, I think, in uh, March, April. For moment. next year? Yeah. Okay, so uh, David L's amazing, and if you do want to get in touch with him, after this, you can go to his website, livingwisdom.co.nz. There you go, livingwisdom.co.nz if you want to get a little bit more info on David now. But we're going to jump into this session now on the fraught journey to heterosexuality. And I do want to say that this is, this is such a rare teaching that I really do want to encourage you to get it out there. And because we're, we're sharing it here in the embassy group, the way to connect your friends and family with this message is just go to the top of the page and you can invite your friends to join the embassy and then once they're in the embassy obviously you can tag them in this post so you can let them know hey this is a great uh, video to check out so let's let's jump in Dave where do you want to start on this journey well uh, I've been counseling in the area of sexual formation uh, sexual development uh, sexual aberration same sex opposite sex uh, and uh, counselling into the LGBT community now for quite a few years. Now, and it's important to clarify for someone of your age, yeah, what yeah. quite a few years it is. Like, is that like 10 years, 20 oh, years, or how long has this I think, journey been for you? I think uh, the first same-sex orientated person knocked on my door about 30 years ago. Okay, so this has been about a 30-year journey. So that's, a, that's quite a long time to process this. Yes, and I have to say that the university and psychological department have been of very little help in this area. They have either gone for the volitional explanation of the evangelical churches, it's a choice you're making, it's sin and you need to stop making it. With or without Jesus' help, you need to repent. And as a result, they are bringing cognitive solutions uh, to a subconscious, uh, non-cognitive uh, dilemma or neurosis. 
Okay, so for some of our people who don't aren't completely fluent in Dave Riddell, what he was saying there. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, I'm looking forward what, to this. <laughs> what he was saying there is that for some people, um, what he was saying is that a lot often in church we're trying to give a conscious solution to an unconscious problem. People aren't a subconscious problem. Yeah, sub, not unconscious problem. Not <laughs> yeah, a, a subconscious problem. So something that people don't realize where the issues are and where the roots are and where where the sexual confusion has come from and where the sexual uh yeah where, where this with the confusion and journey where it's all started See, here's the problem benji mm. i've never met anybody who deliberately consciously cognitively decided to be gay queer bi whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. uh, they always made those calls under duress Mm -hmm. and none of them have been really conscious of where that duress was actually coming from. So there's an and internal so they've tension. Then, they've then opted for the other explanation, uh, it must be genetic. Yeah. If I didn't uh, choose it, if it was thrust on me, then the only other option is it must be genetic. Okay. If I'm not a man, then what am I? Mm -hmm. Am I a woman? And so some have decided they are a woman in a man's body, some have said um, both man and woman. Uh, some have said we'll take it in turns. Uh, mm -hmm. But they've all looked for an explanation, and psychology has let them down, and so has Christianity. Wow. So, really, where do you turn if psychology is letting you down, Christianity is letting you down in terms of its on the surface explanation for what's going on inside of you? Well, Back in the 70s, we were uh, reading Agnes Sanford, John Paula Sanford, mm -hmm. and then I stumbled across this book, which I think needs to be compulsory reading for anybody who's interested in helping in the area of sexual therapy. Mm -hmm. It's the best book by far, and uh, it's now um, perhaps in its 40th year, but it's called The Broken Image. And um, there's also Crisis of Masculinity. Mm -hmm. They're both by the same author, uh, she's absolutely brilliant. Her name's Leanne Payne, and really she should be the hero of the age because uh, she is bringing and has brought the solutions to the, the gay dilemma wow. um, and given us a way out of this genetic determinism that yeah. the LGBT community is so currently stuck in. Yeah. And they really are stuck in it. And the argument is, well, if I didn't choose it, then it was determined for me, therefore it must be genetic. And they're still looking for the science that proves their position. Okay. But there are no same-sex homosexual chromosomes, and that's the problem for them. Yeah. They say that science is against me when I say uh, there is a conversion available from same-sex orientation. But actually, no, that's not correct. Let's let's just um, pause here because this is a, I mean, this is such a, in some ways, if you want to stir the hornet's nest, this is a great topic to oh, talk about. If you, this uh, is the battleground. Uh, some people say you can't have, you can't have uh, fans without having enemies. Uh, but if you if you want to talk about a topic that is going to get a big reaction, you've already had a big reaction in the media. Uh, from this, but I just want to check this out. Dave, do you hate gay people? Oh, absolutely not. And I'm not phobic, homophobic. Uh, I'm not scared of same-sex orientation any more than I'm scared of agoraphobia or any kind of neurosis. To yeah. me, it's just uh, damage. It's fallout. It's the result of the uh, factors that we're going to go through here on the whiteboard. Okay. And as far as I know, nobody else is teaching yeah. this material in the world today. Even Leanne Payne, who's absolutely brilliant, yeah. is only picking on one or two of these factors yes. as the cause needing to be yeah. undone. Great. Well, I guess I wanted to just make that really clear that you know whoever's listening, wherever you are, um, David L and I would say myself as well. You know, people who really love. People, wherever you are in your journey, wherever you are in your journey, there's no condemnation coming through in the message today, but this is uh, coming from a heart. Dave, how many people would you suggest that you've helped that have been really, really just so appreciative of what you're about to share and it's, it's really changed oh, their, I their don't, life? I don't keep track and I don't keep statistics, but it would be in the hundreds. Yeah. Yes. 
everyone from the Samoan Whapapine has been bought up mm -hmm. as a girl boy by mm -hmm. the aunties, mm -hmm. right through to somebody who was traumatised sexually by rape or by um, opposite sex, mm -hmm. traumatic encounter, and just can't go there anymore. Yeah. Uh, there's a wide range of bruising that we're going to have yeah. a look at. Yeah. Uh, but no, hundreds of people, Benji. Hundreds. Yeah. Before we, before we jump into this, and obviously you've got confidentiality uh, that you have to keep in mind, but is there a story that you could share with us about what we're about to get into and how that's actually helped someone who was going through this process, they're on this journey, and then when you shared this with them, it just brought a massive change in their lives. Well, we can do that as we go through the points, if you like. Yeah, great. Because uh, every person that I've helped fits into one of these uh, one of these stories. Well, do you want to choose a, choose a story to start with? And what I really point to what I'd really start? like to do is just take us through this minefield and uh, have a look at what can go wrong Let's go for it. in the journey to heterosexuality. Uh, people are going to recognise themselves in this to some mm. degree. After all, when you think about it, whose uh, sexual identity woke up without any misadventure? Mm. Of all the people listening in now, as they yeah. think back over what awoke their erotic identity, mm. who has got a misadventure-free awakening? Yeah. You know, there's unfortunate incidents, there's misadventure, there's trauma, there's abuse, mm -hmm. and our sexuality is not free of those things. It takes yeah. the punishment, just like every other part of our being. So I don't distinguish conversion therapy, which is a horrible name because it's not really accurate, but I don't uh, distinguish... What, what, what do you mean by conversion well, gay therapy? Gay conversion therapy has all sorts of um, movie-based uh, images mm -hmm. that really muddy the field for any therapist. Yes. Uh, there's coercion, there's bullying, there's pressure, there's religious pressure, there's Bible pressure, there's ugly, dominating uh, figures in religion bullying people out of their same-sex orientation. It's just horrific. And how yeah. effective is that? Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> but no fruit. Oh, it's, no, no, it's, it's all never going to work, is it? Base, it's never going to work because it's a volitional solution. Yeah. And a volitional solution means try harder to be somebody you're not. Yeah. Whereas I'd rather talk about a false self and an authentic self and the way that the child starts living out of a false self while the authentic self is left to starve. Mm. Because false self is built on survival kits, yeah. defense mechanisms. Yeah. You know, when a child starts fantasizing, they're setting themselves up for later a pornography addiction. Yeah. But that fantasizing is already false self beginning yeah. to kick in. Uh, when a person's trying to be somebody they're not, they're always bragging or boasting or trying to be better than they are. They're moving into false self. Yeah. When a person is in escapism all the time, or when a person is constantly trying to get approval, they're yeah. moving into false self. Yeah. And a, a same-sex or opposite-sex identities can also be that false self. If yeah. life doesn't work for me as a boy, then damn it, I'll be a girl. Mm -hmm. And if I hate being a girl, then damn it, I'll be a boy. Yeah, second operations. You know, and then tricky. the other stuff is all secondary to that. Yeah. 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 So this is the emotional scarring and bruising that um, my clients continually report and which we can undo with truth. But it better be the right truth placed in the right place mm. in your heart and soul and mind. Yeah. Because if it's not tailor-made, uh, one size never fits all when it comes to healing sexuality. Yeah. So, yeah, where's your pointy thing? Right, Benji? now, we'll ladies and gentlemen, we'll go, right. this is an old-fashioned laser. Yeah, this yeah. is a laser from the 1870s. Oh, good. This is actually the same type of laser it's that... It's straight, isn't it? Yeah, so the early missionaries in, actually brought these to New Zealand. Yeah for the purpose of, um, of these demonstrations. So there you go, Dave, there's your laser. Now, we're gonna go through this fairly quickly, folks. Um, so what I'm gonna do is actually put up my notes on the, uh, on the site. Yes, so if you would like the notes for today, okay, if you like the notes from this video, I'm going to put the notes from this video under the, uh, in the section called Files, 
in the Facebook group. So if you're at the top of the page, you know, uh, in, in this Facebook group in the embassy, there's all sorts of things you can click on. You can click on announcement, you can click on uh, units, and you can also click on a tab called files. And under that, we'll be putting this up tonight. You'll be able to click on the, the will, notes. Will it go under David Riddell or the Fraud Journey, do you think? We'll call it David Riddell, the Fraud Journey. Just like Cover that. your bases. Yep, there you go. So you'll be able to get these notes, all right? So, and I should explain that this is just one of 70 lectures that we present in the 10-day Living Wisdom course. So I'll be going through it uh, quite a bit quicker than I will in the lecture rooms. If you want to come and do the 10-day course, you're very welcome. You can get information on that on my website, www.livingwisdom.co.nz. Those are held in Nelson, and I've got a couple of dates for you. The next two are January the 6th to the 17th, 2020. Uh, if you can make it in January, you're very welcome. There's still spaces there. And there's another one in Nelson, New Zealand, March the 23rd to April the 3rd. So uh, have a look on the side and see what you think. It's all there. Yeah. But this is just one of 70 lectures that I present over those two weeks. So here we've got the beginning. We could say that this is as young as three years old. We're starting here at about a three-year-old. This is when the seeds are sown for orientation. This is when the seeds are sown for sexuality. Sexuality is not just something that pops up at puberty. Uh, this is something that occurs very early on because a child, a baby at three years old is beginning to identify with mummy or with daddy or even with neither. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're looking at here is defensive detachment. This is going to happen at any age, but defensive detachment is when you get really uh, offended by your father and or your mother a lot of people have disengaged from one or the other. They've stopped trusting them. They've pushed them out of their lives. They no longer believe them. There's been an offense, often as a result of physical abuse, emotional abuse, or divorce in the parents. So here's where you don't want to be like daddy, despite the fact that you're a boy. You don't want to be like mummy. You think she's pathetic and powerless or a victim. You think daddy is a bully or he's a monster, or if that's what it means to be a bloke, I don't want any part of it. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the Bible says a wounded spirit. Yeah. Sorry, the Bible says uh, that a, a brother offended is harder one than a strong city. Now here's a child offended, either by mummy or by daddy, and they don't want to be according to their gender because they've seen it role modeled and they don't want to be any part of it. We call it defensive detachment, it results in rebellion, it results in peer parenting, it results in distrust of father or mother, sometimes both. And I remember going off to boarding school at 12 years of age and discovering a hundred other boys who had all detached from their parents and didn't want to be at home anymore. Ooh. Premature disengagement. Now healthy detachment is called individuation. That's teenage phenomena and that's healthy detachment. But uh, defensive detachment is always premature, and it's a breach of trust. And it means that you no longer grow into the model of femininity or masculinity that your parents set up for you. Uh, and Leanne Payne talks quite a bit about that in her book, uh, especially The Broken Image, uh, which is this one here. And um, there you go. that's an old copy, so the cover will be changed by now, I suppose. Broken Image. Yep. Uh, so that's number one, mine, in the mine field, although these are not in any particular order. This one, I have seen this in front of my own eyes, where a person has a, a biological characteristic. Maybe he's got a squeaky voice. Maybe she's got a masculine voice. Maybe she walks like a bloke. Maybe he walks like a girl. Uh, maybe he's prettier than a girl. Or maybe he speaks with a lisp. These are physical characteristics, and these are the genetic bits that people refer to. That is genetic determination at work. Where it crosses over from being DNA-based, and this is very important because most people miss the difference, is it now becomes a social interpretation. Mm. And I've seen it happen in churches too. Some bloke comes in, 
and he's got a poncy walk by virtue of nature and he's immediately picked on as having a gay spirit, a homosexual spirit or some such thing. And he's labelled, happens in church as much as it does outside. And she's a bit of an outdoors girl or a tom girl or a bit masculine and she gets labelled, pounced on, prayed for, demons cast out. It's just horrendous. And the same thing is going on in the world. When I started boarding school, three other guys started the same year as me. One spoke with a lisp, one had a poncy walk, and one was prettier than a girl. And they got the nicknames Gay, Ho and Dolly every hour of every day for the next three years. Now nobody can resist that kind of social pressure forever. And by the time they left boarding school, they had concluded that they must be gay. And that's the difference, really. Uh, the physical characteristic is misconstrued and labelled, and the person then grows into it. Does that make sense? Just checking um, that people can hear all right. Don't don't swap it. Okay. Just uh, just checking. Are you guys hearing us okay now? Is it? To, um, give us a thumbs up if you're hearing okay. Just want to make sure that we've got the audio going well there for people. What are they saying there, Calvin? People okay on the audio? Mm, no replies yet. No replies yet? That takes a little while. Okay, well I'll carry we'll, on. We'll carry on, we'll just um, yeah. project a little bit. Okay, so the third one, uh, which I call imprinting or critical period awakening. And so here's the, uh, the boy that um, introduces the other boy to masturbation and many many of my same-sex uh, clients have started out their erotic life this way. Imprinting critical period awakening can be the result of a child looking at same-sex pornography, homosexual pornography and getting excited by that. Imprinting uh, can be any traumatic or premature introduction to erotic arousal. It reminds me of the baby foal or zebra uh, whose mother stands side on to the newborn foal or calf uh, and they don't move for about half an hour while their own unique print pattern is imprinted onto the foal. Wow. And then that foal will follow that unique pattern for the rest of its calf life. That's a wow. pattern. And every baby bird, the same thing. If you are the first moving object that a baby bird sees when it's born, then as far as it's concerned, you're mummy. Wow. And uh, they can have terrible problems trying to convince an animal or bird uh, that it's not a human once imprinting has occurred mm. because they don't recognise their own species. Wow. Did you see that movie, um, Fly Away Home? Uh, yes. That's mm. a very good example yes. of that. Those birds, those geese were imprinted on that girl and so she had to learn to fly a microlite to teach the birds to migrate. Mm. Yeah. Now some of them eventually twig on that they've actually made a terrible mistake, <laughs> but often they don't and they're yeah. useless for the wild. So we are the same. Sexual mm. orientation is a subconscious imprinting phenomena. It's not a deliberate choice, it's hormonally induced. And that's a critical period time. And so we call this critical period attachment or critical period awakening. And it's critical because it's very difficult to undo once it's occurred. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. So difficult that many people never get success in it. It requires specific therapy, actually. Why? Because you've got to retrain your subconscious. And to do that, your subconscious has to be conscientized. And this is what most people don't experience. They don't actually get it up and out so they can look at it and rearrange it. Well, it's the same with any phobia. It's yeah. the same with any obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. It's the same with so much of my work. Uh, we can work in the conscious and only achieve so much before we've got to get into the subconscious programming and we've got to reboot the whole system. Wow. Be transformed by the rebooting of your mind is what I call Yes. It. <laughs> so that's yeah. number three. And I can tell you story after story of people who have suddenly realised. I remember uh, one lesbian, uh, she stormed out of the counselling session after her first session. 
She said, I thought that you had your head around this, but you're just an evangelical Christian like the rest of them who's trying to convince me to be somebody. I'm not. Goodbye. Mm. I said, I'll see you in a week, but before you go, I've got a homework task for you. Who or what first aroused within you sexual excitement? And she said, yeah, whatever, and slammed the door. <laughs> I didn't expect to see her again in a week, but in a week she was back. And she said, well, as you know, we didn't part on good terms. But she said, on the bus on the way home, I prayed and I said, God, if you care about me and my predicament, show me what set me up for this. Because she had been sold the line, it was DNA, genetics, and there's nothing she could do about it. Yeah. And she'd had a live-in lover, or partner, or wife, or whatever you want to call her, for 10 years. Wow. And she was, you know, in the lifestyle, up to her eyeballs. And on the bus on the way home, she had a vision. And she saw herself, literally in a vision, mm. in bed with a friend on a sleepover at four years old. Mm. And she remembered fondling each other and wow. awakening excitement. He was wow. excited. Four years old on a sleepover. Mm. But it's usually three strikes and you're out. I said, okay, I get that. That set you up. Give me a confirming experience further down the track. And she said, oh, that's easy. She said, I was in all girls school. There was a prefect there and I had a crush on her. And for a year I served her. Wow. As a, as a, as a um, prefect is allowed. Uh, they used to call them fags in the old days. Wow. And she said, I served her, looked after her, whatever I could. And she said, that sort of thing is just so unhealthy if you're already orientated. And I said, all right, thank you. Now give me the third strike. Okay. And she said, do you know everything about me? I said, no, I'm winging it. But I have a feeling there's another one. Yeah. She couldn't think of anything, so we prayed. And I just said, Lord, any other rubbish, please. We need to see it. And as we prayed, it came back to her that to prove that she was normal, she had gone on a date at 14. And this boy had more power than he knew what to do with. And he fondled her and he groped her and he disgusted her. And then she said to herself, well, if that's heterosexuality, I don't want any part of it. Wow. Three strikes and you're out, mate. Mm. And so 20 years later, she became a Christian. And she came to me wondering what on earth to do with her orientation. Wow. And I was only allowed to give her one answer, which is, oh, well, it's genetic. It's God's will. You're stuck with it. Live with it. And I wasn't going to do that. Wow. Because, you know, uh, give me an honest, genuine, same-sex orientated person and A, I'll show you how they came to be like that and wow. B, how to turn them around. Well, I mean, this is huge, isn't it? I mean, this is so huge and for our generation. the face of the, of the whole psychological establishment. Yeah. And even the Christians are giving up on repentance as a solution now. Yeah, well, I mean, they are. They're giving into it. Yeah, it's a huge. This is a huge topic, isn't it, guys? I mean, what do you think? The massive topic or not? And the, this is such so big because people are only just getting told. They're getting told, yeah, it's in your genetics. You're just you're born gay, um, and there's really nothing you can do about it. It's a love affair with genetic determination, and it's just not right. Um, and even if a child is born with both uh, generic devices, it soon becomes obvious that one of them, that one of those, uh, what shall we call them, um, they are superfluous to the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but parents can't wait that long. They put pressure on the gynaecologist and the surgeon mm -hmm. to sort out this baby's genetics straight away. Yeah, they're freaked out. Oh, as you would be. And often they just make the wrong call. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. so you'd think that the chromosomes would settle the argument, but it doesn't. Mm. Yeah. So uh, that's what are we up to? Number three, number, number four, four. Initial number four. traumatic opposite sex experience. Okay, and that's what she had. Yeah, she that had was her strike, strike three. Yeah, that was her strike three. Now I, I should say that there's nothing magical about the number three. It's just that usually it takes more than one mine to blow you right out of the water. Yeah. But one of these landmines can do it. Yeah. 
depending on the strength and the intensity and also the timing. Yeah. Timing is quite important. For example, well, what can uh, blow you out of the water here at eight years old may have little or no effect when you're 20 years old. Mm. Yeah. So that initial traumatic opposite sex experience <coughs> can leave a very bad taste in your mouth. It can bias you against all boys or all girls. Mm. It can put you off the, on the defensive. It can be date rape. It can be raped by a stranger. It can be any kind of violation that makes mm. you feel for the rest of your life extremely unsafe around the opposite sex. Well, and that just covers a myriad of incidents oh. and issues. Yeah. And I say, you know, people can be same-sex orientated for the same reason that people uh, can be frightened or paranoid or bruised or uh, ambivalent, you know. Mm. Uh, sexual damage is essentially no different to any other emotional traumatic damage. Yeah. And so that's why I don't specialise in working in sexuality. It's yeah. just it's just one kind of emotional damage that walks through my door yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. And so I don't want to become known as the guy who makes queer people straight. That's not what I'm about. I'm about healing the psyche of trauma and frights and damage and misguidance. I mean, you can be just as damaged by toxic religion yeah. as you can by um, traumatic sexual encounter. To me, it's all just bruising. Yeah. And a wounded spirit, who can bear? Yeah. Nobody can bear a wounded spirit for long. If you don't find the truth, you're going to go under yeah. and that permanently. Wow. A wounded spirit, who can bear? And only the truth can heal a wounded spirit. Yeah. The truth that's in forgiveness, being covered by the blood, being completely forgiven. The truth that occurs to us when we have the courage to revisit these traumatic events mm -hmm. and take with us a Christian's mind, the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. and to reinterpret what the heck went on there. Yeah. A lot of people are uh, still suffering the wounding of parents whom they judge for rejecting them or not loving them or not taking good care of them, mm -hmm. but they're interpreting it all as children, not as adults. Mm -hmm. So that initial trauma, I mean, we've got to revisit it and we've got to revise it got to relinquish the resentment and the pain that comes yeah. from it. And that's huge in itself as well. We see lots of pretty high statistics at the moment of the percentage of young boys and girls who've been abused, you know, even before they're 16 or by the time, age of 20. Absolutely. Yeah. What, just from your experience roughly, what would you suggest the statistics are of, of well, people experiencing sexual abuse? I like to ask who had a sexual awakening without trauma of yeah. some sort. It's mm. coming ready or not. Yeah. Um, it, it's true that people get through without any damage. Some people go right through this minefield and not even mm. aware there is a minefield. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. both yeah. of your parents have got to be card-carrying Baptists to do yeah. that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Okay, here, uh, uh, here's number five. You'll often find that gay people form a very, very tight uh, codependency with a same-sex person. And they may still be heterosexual at heart, but they've got a very tight liaison with another same-sex person because this person has become their safe place. Mm. This person is my human refuge. Wow. And if this person dumped me or rejected me, I'd probably cut my wrists. Wow. Yeah, because this is my only sanctuary. Mm. And that's why you'll find there's a lot of paranoia, a lot of mind games in these relationships as well, because they really cling to each other. Mm. You know, here, there may be some real manipulation and some real coercion going on, so that you, my human refuge, do never leave me, abandon me, dump me, or wow. reject me. Yeah. You're my safety, you've got my back, you're my answer to the threats of the world. Mm -hmm. As long as you're looking out for me, I'm yeah. gonna make it. Yeah. But if you ever leave me, you know, yeah. it's um, goodbye. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, they may actually not be gay, they might just be very, very frightened of life. 
my human yeah. refuge. Um, oh, right. I think the quote here should be, it's us against the world. Okay. Yeah. It's us yeah. against the world. Often in high school they were persecuted. Mm -hmm. And so two persecuted people get together yeah. mm -hmm. and find a refuge. And then out of that yep. grows. Yeah, there might be a better name for that, but my human refuge is what I call it. Yeah. And it is, it's always a, a codependency. Okay. All right. Next one, very common, unrecognized grief. Did you know, for example, uh, that amongst adopted children, when they find their missing father or mother, sometimes it becomes sexual? Well, as they seek to fill the father void or the mother void. Well, this is a father gap, this is a mother gap, and this is powerful stuff. You go looking for what you could not find because your parents were divorced or they were absent or they were preoccupied. Well, and, and who's calling forth the masculine within the boy? Ooh. Nobody. And so he's attracted to pictures of strong, powerful, naked men. Because there, he's trying to claim his uh, masculinity. Well, wow. Where does a woman find her femininity if mum was unavailable or was not proud of her own femininity or considered femininity a threat to life, successful mm. living? So that's actually unrecognised grief. And there are many people today who are grieving for the lack of masculine validation or feminine comfort. Mm. And it's never occurred to them that they're actually in grief. And that grief is the basis of same-sex attraction. Wow. Never and occurred. in a world of broken families? Yeah, absolutely. Are we we're so set up for this? Absolutely. But it looks like, I mean, we're just, we're just making our way through this. There's a couple more, but you can see it really is a minefield. Absolutely. It's a, it's a crazy mind here. And that's why I call it the fraught journey. Yeah. Because it is fraught. And if you guys graduated as heterosexuals, uh, congratulations. Wow. You got through. But for many people, they get through and they're holding a marriage together, heterosexual marriage together. But um, is that camera getting the shakes, is it? No, no you're okay. Right. It's not an earthquake. No, no, no. no, no something's no. worse. It's cold. Um, that. Uh, use, the, <laughs> use the other one. Oh. Mic issues. Come uh, on, Mike, behave yeah. yourself. Um, what was I saying? Uh, if anyone graduated to hit oh, yeah, yeah. already well done. Yeah, well done because, you, but for many, they graduate to it. Oh, you're talking about? They're lacking sexual drive for their partner. Well, wow. yeah. Uh, there's old resentment still there, working against attraction, physical attraction, and so they're in a sexless marriage. Yeah. They're not going to be gay, they're not going to leave their partner, but it's a sexist marriage because uh, they lack the uh, masculinity or the femininity that desires and reaches out to each other. Ooh. And this is a very common issue in marriage counselling. Wow. And it often causes alienation and struggles in a marriage. Um, he doesn't want her. He knows he ought to want her, he wants to want her, but the want there's something wrong with it. Wow. And the same her side to him. Uh, she's, uh, she wants to be a good wife. She really, really wants to be a good wife. But there's something just missing in the chemistry. Uh, there's something missing in the feminine affection. It's not there. There's an old layer of resentment towards masculine authority or masculine initiative or masculine advancement. And she's not aware it's there, but it's there doing its poisonous work the whole time. Wow. So I've got to fish that stuff out to give them back a real intimacy. Wow. And I think that uh, the uh, almost made it to heterosexuality, but not quite, is a, a commonly undiagnosed issue. Ooh, I get a lot of students huge. who say, well, I'm not gay, but I'm not completely convinced that I want a man or a woman either. Ooh. And that's, that's the grey zone. The no yeah, well, no one talks about that no grey zone. Uh, no, no one, one talks about that grey zone. No. I've been having homosexual thoughts, but I'm not gay. What am I going to do? Yeah. And uh, straight away, I think, hello, we've got unrecognised grief. Yeah. Or we've got an old initial trauma or something going on there. Yeah. So that's a real dynamic. And, I mean, that... 
you, know, you hear a few stories, I've heard a few stories as well of Christian couples marry and hetero, you know, heterosexual marriage and it's all going well. Then, then out of, it seems like out of the blue, yeah. a homosexual affair happens. Uh, yeah, and it was never out of the blue, never. There's always for the, for the spectator from the, the out, spectator, from the that's outside, right. that's a right. person who hasn't seen the journey that someone else has gone yeah. on. Yeah, it seems like uh, something completely uh, and, left field. And in on. therapy, what we have to do is um, spot the trail because it's in following the trail back that we discover what caused it and why you can disown it. You know, tracing, facing, and replacing the growth of that mm -hmm. desire is what counselling and psychotherapy is for, but ultimately it's so that they can disown false self. Yes. To disown. And that's why James said, you know, confess your faults one to another, because as soon as you do that, you start the process of disowning it. Yes. And the disowning is where it loses its grip. Yes. So that's... Um, uh, so, I mean, false self, the way that you use the word false self, could be interchangeable with identity crisis. Uh, yes, it could, absolutely. Well, the false self is the swan who thought he was an ugly duck. Mm. False self is the way of coping by being girly or being boyish. Yeah. False self is a survival kit and a defense mechanism. Yeah. Now, let me, let me ask you this question, because guys, I think this is just massive in our generation and massive thoughts that, that's literally shaping huge mindsets in our, in our world right now. So what you're talking about, right, is you're talking about uh, faith, you know, face, trace, and replace, which is face the lie. Hang on, let's get it right. Oh. We trace it first. Sorry, trace it, trace it. Mm. Trace. Trace the cause, trace, trace the, the cause. incident. Yep. Face. Trace the conclusion. Yep. And then face up to the misbelief that you swallowed. So face, yeah, yep. the... The lie, the, the misconclusion, that or the yep. or the false the false self, the false identity. Renounce it. Yep. yep. And then replace it with the truth. Replace it with the truth. Replace it with um, life skills and insights and scriptural truth that will displace that whole mindset. All right. So ultimately, here, what you're talking about is is a. A deep subconscious journey that's going on so often it's going on totally yeah because it's happening subconsciously no one's even aware that they've been on this journey so there's these subconscious beliefs happening for people that when you get into the into this journey with them in a counseling session you can actually identify those false beliefs and they have to be identified Benji because no one can paint over rust yeah. without the rust coming straight back through. Yeah. You know, if you've got rot in the building, you've got to dig it out. Yeah. You don't just go to the top of it. Yeah. And so for me, when I'm counselling, it's never behaviourism. That's a dirty word in the mm -hmm. Bible wisdom. Yeah. It's never try harder. Yeah. It's never willpower. Yeah. It's always dig out the rot. Wow. So that then there'll be no more trouble with it. Yeah. So here's here's where I'm going with this, guys. It's because you're the tools of your trade are like are the truth. You know, finding the lie and, and tailor made truth, fitted yeah, truth, a specific truth for yeah. this has for to this be person. Fitted. But what I'm seeing is in this generation and in, in our world right now is a huge trend towards relativity. Oh, yeah. Which relativity? Maybe you could you, you're great at defining relativity. Well, this is where I call it my philosophical philosophical training. Yes. Because living wisdom is a combination of theology, psychology, and philosophy. Yeah. All integrated into a scripturally harmonious package. Yeah. And so what I say regarding the philosophy of knowledge, which is epistemology, mm -hmm. is this. We have to learn to place absolute truth in its proper place and relative truth in its proper place. Mm -hmm. Huge confusion today between absolute truth and culture. Mm -hmm. Well, culture is almost always relative truth. Yeah. But the absolute truth under the relative truth is that people need to be treated with respect. Yeah. And relationships always go better if they're built on respect. Yeah. So that's an absolute truth. Yeah. But how you show and convey that respect is culturally determined, and that's the relative mm -hmm. truth. 
So we've got to have both. Yeah. And everybody wakes up sexually or erotically. That's mm -hmm. the absolute truth. Yeah. But how appropriate sexuality is expressed is a bit more relative in yeah. different cultures. Yeah. What I'm what I'm noticing is when it comes to identity, when it comes to what a person believes about themselves, that this dynamic of of truth is totally irrelevant. Yeah. That really a person wakes up like they they in their life journey it's not discovering truth of who you are it's just deciding who you are yeah okay. it's and, and i'm yeah. seeing this relativity where you say hey you know even to the point where people there's huge trends about people saying i no longer associate with being human mm. i associate my identity with a, a type of animal or i associate my identity even people associated they no longer believe that they're a uh, you know, well, even even being like new words coming out now, like transracial, yeah. they say, "Well, I identify more with this race." So, yeah, yeah. there comes a point where uh, God says, "Look, here's the canvas. Your soul, your personality, your character will be the canvas. You, the essential center, and the essential spirit is the I." And you as spirit are like an artist painting on your own canvas and you can paint whatever you please. But mark me well, my child, you are gonna to have to live with that forever. Mm. So paint carefully and paint wisely. Uh, because if you paint a um, character that you can't live with, that's gonna be hell. Mm. And that, in that sense, people create their own eternity. Mm. And some people create heaven to live in and some people create hell to live in. Mm. Uh, the thing is that all hell is anti-reality uh, because the will of God, we know, is reality. Mm. And so people start creating delusions and then they live in those delusions. Mm. And I work every day with people who can no longer live in the attitude that they have built. Mm. Every day I, people come to see me who can't live in the attitude that they have built because it's destroying their family or their mm. marriage or their bank account or their happiness or their peace. And so I have to show them, you know, you've built a false self. Mm. You're going to have to dismantle that. And this is just that whole principle applied to sexuality. Yeah. Look at this one here, childhood rejection of gender. What does that mean? It means when I looked at my dad, I thought if that what it means to be a bloke, I don't want any part of it. Or it means I can't relate to dad, he's, he's out to lunch, but I can relate to mum, providing I take on the feminine mm. and get fascinated by what fascinates her, mm. and then I can identify with that. Mm. I was in Melbourne recently, and I couldn't believe how many of those inner town city guys were wearing makeup mm. and identifying themselves as metro guys. Well, well, they learned that by bonding to their mums. Mm. And they entered her world a little too far. And so they rejected their masculinity or nobody awoke the masculine within them. Mm. And it's the same for a, a, a woman who thinks her femininity is a liability. Mm. Now here's another thought that's very interesting. And Leanne Payne points this out in her book, Crisis and Masculinity. Adam originally was male and female. Mm made in the image of God, male and female. Yes. And then God divided them up into mm. the feminine pole and the masculine pole. Mm. And in Jewish custom, marriage restores that division. So right. now we are one right. unit again. Mm. We are the masculine and the feminine. Now, the law of physics teaches us that opposites attract. So they need each other. Mm. Um, quantum physics teaches us that matter and antimatter must go together. Right. There's a whole dark universe called mm. antimatter that equals the matter universe. Yeah. And in the same way, if I develop my masculinity, that's great, but I long for the feminine part of me as well. Mm. So I want to get married. Yeah. Trouble is, if I marry a masculine woman, there's now two captains on the bridge there's now two coach drivers on the same stagecoach. Mm. There's now uh, two initiatives and two strong wills. There's no complementarity. 
Is well, that a word? Complementarity? It sounds like they for double language, so we'll go with it. It's not complementary. Complementarity sounds good. And uh, complementarity. What about synchronicity? That'll do. There we go. I know that one's in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, compliment, you heard it first. Complementarity, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. by Dave Riddell. <laughs> and so, uh, if my wife begins to become masculine, instead of cooperating, we become competitors. Mm. And if I become feminine, she goes, I don't need another woman. I'm already a woman. Mm. What I need is a bloke. Mm. And I know it's difficult to define what is essentially masculine and what is essentially feminine. I can't say I can easily define that, but I know when it's missing. Yeah. I know when my wife is being responsive to me and I know when she's competing with me. Mm. And it never works when she starts competing. Because um, you're quite a fast runner. <laughs> well, she hasn't challenged me to a run. <laughs> but you know, uh, if a man is insecure in himself, whenever a woman asserts herself, she begins to threaten his masculinity. Mm. And so the answer is, should he develop his assertiveness and his masculinity, or should she back off? Mm. And the answer to that depends on their backgrounds and what's motivating them. Yeah. But it's a very difficult thing to get to grips with. Yeah. And if she's rejected her femininity, mm -hmm. and she doesn't trust men, and she wants to know why, and she wants to argue the toss, and uh, she doesn't do trusting, if she does uh, power and control, shall right. we say, yeah. then we're going to have a battle at home. It's going to mm. be an ongoing power struggle. Mm. And you can tell those marriages because the teenagers want to get out of home as quick as possible. Wow. They live in a power struggle. Wow. And they're over it. They don't want to come home to tension. Now, um, that's why it's very important that, that both male and female learn negotiation skills yeah. so that they don't need to slide into this power struggle. Yes. And finally, misvalidation by misguided adults. This is the a last problem. one. Misguided adults. You wouldn't find those around. Well, you know, um, <laughs> uh, my son, you know, he likes to dress in pink, so I bought him a total girl's wardrobe, and I really, you know, make the most of it when he's oh, putting lipstick on and high heels. There was, there was a big case about this in the media recently about a young boy watching the Frozen movie. <clears throat> and his mum decided that he must be a girl. There you go. Because he was watching the Frozen movie. Now, that had all sorts of different... Uh, okay, my child, things are going to change around here. I've just redecorated your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whereas my son watches Frozen, and I've watched Frozen with all my kids, and I didn't find that that really was influencing my gender. Well, I do, I do care about the mother's predicament. She is confused, and parents now are actually being frightened by any kind of stereotyping at all. Mm. And so we don't let our son play with guns because that's masculinizing him in, in a very abhorrent way. Or we don't give our daughter any dolls to play with because mm. that's you know conditioning her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they're really going out of their way to try and neutralise the polar differences. Mm. It's not helping. Um, it's true that there is some social uh, content. Whoever said that blue was masculine and pink was feminine, I don't know. I like a bit of pink myself. Well, but I, uh, the I, I wore a pink <coughs> shirt last year. My wife talked me into it, right? She was the classic, right? Flip it. Guys, this, 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 is, this is for the guys out there. When your, when your lady tells you that it's salmon, <laughs> it's just salmon. I don't know. For me, this is this. I I crossed the line. I was like, okay, maybe it's salmon. So I bought this expensive shirt. But after wearing it, I was like, no, it's not salmon. Fortunately, I was preaching somewhere where no one really knew me. I couldn't wait to get home and get that pink shirt Mate. off. Funny, but funnily though, right? I gave it to my father-in-law, who was stoked. <laughs> and, and so it's probably I was different for different people. Myself. Yeah, you would have, it was a very nice shirt. Apparently I looked great in it. But, um, but this is part of the problem. When we start typecasting people into yeah. a narrow, rigid framework, this is masculine and this is feminine. Yeah. Mate, when I stopped playing rugby as a teenager, my masculinity was called into question immediately. Yes. Mm. When I stopped playing rugby and picked up tennis, what kind of a girl are you? 
Oh, well, no. Straight away. Yeah, well, see, and you should play tennis in the summer. And then I committed the unforgivable sin. Oh, no. I but... brought flowers into my room. Oh, wow. I love flowers. I'm yeah. a gardener. I love yeah. flowers. I stop and smell roses. And the blokes go, hmm. Well, especially in, a New, in New Zealand culture. Absolutely. New Zealand culture is... Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's changing a lot, but the his, historically New Zealand culture is very much rugby. You know, this should be another mind in the minefield. Yeah. It is definitely. like can, I'm being cost, suffocated by this claustrophobic definition of how men and women should mm. be. And I, it's too narrow for me. Mm. Mm. So if I want to wear pink shirts, smell flowers, arrange flowers and play the violin, it does not call into question my masculinity. Absolutely, and I do all those things. The so funny, funny thing though, right? Because here I am, here I am struggling with pink. You know, like it just a, salmon, salmon, <laughs> yeah. salmon. I was just having an issue with it personally. But then my son, right, Ezra, he's like, my favorite color is pink, and I'm like, ah. But it's like, you know, I was like, okay, your favorite color is pink. For now, that may or may not change. But I'm like, it's just, I think the culture, right? Because in in Thailand, right, when I go to Thailand, they're all wearing highlighter pink and the boys are walking around holding hands and that's not even seen, that's not even seen as a, a gay gay thing. It's just a normal, a normal way so of... So here's an appeal. Thing. Can we please give genders more space to enjoy their talents and develop their abilities without having to label them or box them or put them in the other camp because they're going to grow into it if you keep doing that. This, this just just on this kind of dynamic of, of slightly, you know, like how you're talking about like between different cultures, it's quite different because when you're in Asia, you can be walking around in Asia like with a, with a friend and then all of a sudden he tries to slip his hand in your hand and, and <laughs> you're, he, he's wanting to walk down the road, hand in hand with his fingers interlocked and your fingers. And when you come from New Zealand, you go and sorry, you I'm Kiwi. I don't do that. You experience that. You're like, oh, hello, what is <laughs> what is going on here? But if you actually look around, a lot of the guys will, will walk around holding hands, and it's not actually relative truth. Yeah, there you go. It's just what you're saying about relative and, relative and cultural truth. differences. It's relative truth. So, <laughs> misvalidation by misguided adults it's could be a bit. teacher. Could yeah. be a teacher. Yeah. In classrooms today, teachers are being encouraged not to do anything that could be seen as stereotyping. Mm. And uh, and it can be worse than that. It can actually become some kind of enforcement. Mm. Uh, it's projection, uh, it's misconstrual, it's misinterpretation, and it's equally as bad, if you like, as reverse. Mm. So we've got a problem. And we're not really getting on top of it yet. Um, can, you, can you give some stories just to unpack this one a little bit? I'd love to just kind of hear a little bit deeper on what you're saying. Really? What would this look like for someone? Oh, a number of clients now have reported that when they were somewhere between three years old and six years mm -hmm. old, their older sisters dressed them up as girls, mm -hmm. put makeup on them, put them in mummy's high heeled shoes, put a dress on them, and then really made a big fuss of them. Accolades, mm. validation, affirmation, mm. mm. and the little boy felt great. Now he existed. Mm. Now he was the life of the party. Now he was somebody. And then he puts his boy clothes back on, but he never forgets that if you want to feel really good, just dress up as a girl. Mm. And that is the beginnings for so many men of the transvestite thing. And the and, and the cross dressing, and it comes back to a single incident that may not have taken more than thirty minutes of his life back in the day, wow. and he knows where to go. He doesn't need to go to pornography. He doesn't need to go and visit a prostitute or have an affair. He just needs to get his wife's clothes and put them all on while she's away, and that the warm fuzzies all come back. The echoes all come mm. back. And of course, when she catches them out, which eventually she does, she's shocked to the core. And it rattles their marriage like nothing else. She can't handle it. He's ashamed, embarrassed. He can't handle it. What are they going to do now? Probably come and see me. Devastated. Mm. Mm. 
And I've, I've witnessed that scenario in my office so many times. She's tearful and, and shocked, and he's ashamed. And sometimes, sometimes the blokes are drinking far too much and getting blasted just to stop the shame of the pornography or the affairs or the whatever, make it go away. And they join AA and they end up addicted to an escape. They end up addicted to AA. Mm. But alcohol was never the real issue. Yeah. The issue was the guilt and the shame. Yeah. And they're just trying to make it go away for a short time. Wow. So it escalates. It all escalates. And of course the burden is even stronger if they're a Christian because um, they know enough to know that that isn't the mind of Christ for them. But they don't know enough to escape it. Wow. And many Christian men and women are going, Jesus, why have you left me in this hole? Or am I cursed? Or is this genetic? And usually they come to the genetic conclusion and leave the church. Wow. Because the church is not a safe place currently uh, for same-sex orientated people. I don't call them gay. I haven't met a gay gay yet. Wow. I've met a lot pretending to be gay. But, you know, who enjoys being ostracised or rejected or called queer or trying to claim the right to have a husband when they're already a bloke? It's not easy. They're not gay. They maybe can, but there's a world of difference between being camp and being gay. Now, how would you define so, that? Well, you know what camp is. It's the pretense of being the other sex. And uh, the life of the party. Oscar Wilde is a good example. But Oscar Wilde was not gay in the true sense of the word. So I have a lot of pity and a lot of compassion uh, for people who are still under the power of childhood bruisings, hurts, abandonments, rejections and betrayals and they're hiding in a same-sex situation or a bisex or uh, any one of a mm. dozen other options. Can you think of any stories where someone has lived believing that they were born gay, leaving, believing that this is a genetic thing, and they've come to you uh, feeling, that, feeling you know, this, this internal tension of it, but believing that they're born gay, and ultimately that there's no hope, like nothing can oh. change, but Which story feeling that you want? Which story do you want? One guy, he called me up, and we do a lot of counselling over Skype these mm -hmm. days, uh, and he was on Skype to me, and he said, you know, I've been with my lover, another man, for about 15 years, 20 mm -hmm. years, and my parents are, can't hide the hurt, no grandchildren, mm -hmm. but he said they've kind of got used to it, they're okay, I think. But he said, I know I was born that way, he said, but I just want to check out, I've heard you disagree with that thesis, so I'd just like to check out your reasons. Now, he's one of the few uh, same-sex orientated people who don't just chuck rocks at me from a distance. He's actually mm -hmm. rung up to say, you know, let me understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I emailed him the same text I'm putting up on the website here. Yeah, that's uh, basically straight out of this manual, the Living Wisdom Manual. Mm -hmm. And it's just two A4 pages. And I yeah. said, here buddy, diagnose yourself from this and get back to me. Yeah. I'll give you a week to think about it. Mm. A week later, he called me back and he said, mate, he said, you have destroyed my life. Well, he said, I've reawoken as a heterosexual. He said, I'm no longer attracted to my partner, don't want to sleep with him, don't want to continue in this lifestyle. My business is built on this lifestyle, so I'm going to have to quit it. And he said, I am in a crisis. He said, I don't know how to be heterosexual, but I'm no longer gay. Wow. As a result. And that's just from reading. That's right. These two pages. That's right. Which is basically this on the board. This story here. He said, I saw myself in two of those episodes and he said, I suddenly understood that I have learned same-sex orientation. I wasn't born that way. Wow. And he said, you've given me some hope because you told me that whatever's been learned can be unlearned. Wow. But he said, you know, I've realised now that the guy who awoke my 
identity. Mm -hmm. He said he was a housemaster at an all boys college. Mm -hmm. They hide out there, some of these guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, and now I'm looking for him who seduced me when I was seven or eight years old. And wow. I said, and you're telling me this because, he said, because I bought a gun and when I find him, I'm going to end his life. Wow, he destroyed my life. My parents have no grandchildren. And now I'm going to destroy his life. And he said, then the score will be settled. And suddenly I didn't want to be a counsellor anymore. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Did you book him in for another session? Oh, yeah. Well, we got through that one. Uh, <laughs> wow. We got through that one because I helped him understand that, you know, one victim turning into two victims is not going to help anybody. Yeah. And so he gave, wow. up, he gave up the gun that he had bought specially. Wow. But uh, having said that, it was a long journey for him to learn to trust women again. He had to learn how to trust a female. Mm. So was that obvious? Was that one of his wounds as well? Was, was, yeah. yeah, betrayal. Wow. Yeah. So he had to learn that um, one size doesn't fit all, mm -hmm. and a lot of these people are deeply prejudiced against their own gender or against the opposite gender mm -hmm. by a traumatic experience. Yeah. And um, their understanding of trust freezes, they're in arrested development, they haven't understood that every person must be assessed on their own merits. Yeah. So if you're a bloke, you're dangerous. If you're a woman, you're dangerous. It's best to just keep your walls up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a prejudice. That's all it is. And it's like, I'm getting flat from the LGBT community because they think I'm prejudiced against them or they think that I do some kind of dreadful uh, gay conversion therapy that's going to mess with their self-worth and their self-esteem, etc. Mm. None of these things are true, but you yeah. know, if they're biased, they don't care about the truth. They yeah. care only about confirming their bias. Yeah. And some of them are vicious, vitriolic. Yeah. And you ask, where does this vicious vitriol come from? And it comes from the fear that if it isn't genetic and there's nothing I can do about it, where does that leave me? Do you think that so many people have just resigned to like, okay, it's genetic, there's nothing I can do? They just Well, it gives them an out and it stops them from questioning, examining or fighting with themselves. Yeah. They just float downstream. I mean, if you feel like, if everyone has told you that there's no hope, that this is the way it is, you wouldn't look for... It's not just same-sex intervention. You know, I get told that um, that uh, OCD is genetic and alcoholism is a genetic disease, and I get told that ADHD is genetic, and I get told that um, dyslexia is genetic. The trouble is I'm turning out people every week who are healed of it. Now, if it's wow. genetic, you can't be healed of it. Wow. If it was genetic, I wouldn't be able to point to one client who had gone from same sex attraction to opposite sex attraction. Not yeah, one. absolutely. But I can. I can point to scores of them. Well, I can't because it's confidential. Yeah. And I don't do statistics. I don't send out mail out saying, you know, are you still engaging in homosexual acts? Yeah. Are you now? Uh, the same way as I don't send out. Uh, feedback forms to clients are you still phobic do you still have fears or doubts blah blah mm. it, it's it's not a science yeah you know we're dealing here with emotional natures it's not a science mm. but I wouldn't still be doing it if it wasn't working wow mm. so what would you say to just advice for people because I know that right now you, I mean you talked about that story of that, that man just talked about, his parents had gotten over the fact that they weren't going to get grandkids. No, yeah. there's, there's lots of family members right now, and lots of Christian families with family members who are you know, having homosexual journeys and, and coming to the place of conclusion. Yeah, like how, how, what would you recommend that family members do for uh, their family who are in, on a homosexual journey? in this homosexual space. Download the text and do a do-it-yourself diagnosis, either of yourself or your child or your adult child. You'll see them pop up in here. If you do that, then you've got the tools you need. 
But once you've done that and you've found the etiology, the beginning, uh, the causes, then you're going to have to talk to someone like me who can lead you right out. Yeah. This, is, this is a diagnostic system. This is a fault tracing chart. This is not the whole solution. But the thing is, this will convince people that they actually learned it, they did not inherit it. Wow, that's so big, isn't it? Thank you. So just, just as a reminder, if you want to get the PDF of this uh, content, all that you need to do to get the PDF is just go on to the, into the Files tab, okay? Uh, on, in this group, there's a space where it says Announcements, Units, Events, Files. Click on the Files one, and we're going to upload this tonight. So very soon you'll be able to get that uh, Get that from right here in the embassy, right? So and give us a day or so, we'll, we'll upload it. Can I just talk to Christian parents who just feel so powerless to help their children? You know, the answer is, will you pray for them? But frankly, praying for them can just be an expression of panic and powerlessness. Mm. You need to upskill yourself. That's what you need wow, to do. that's a big deal. You need to upskill yourself so you understand sexual formation. You understand it better than the psychologists down the road understand because they do not understand. It. Yeah. And when you've got a few of those clues together, then you're in a far better position to help your child re-nurture the masculine within them or the feminine within them. We both have access to both. But for one reason or another, one of those pole, polar opposites has been starved and it's in arrested development. Your son has stopped developing masculinity. He's passive. He's, uh, he's uh, trying too hard to impress. Um, your daughter is not warm or affectionate or uh, she doesn't understand her own femininity and thinks it's a liability. So what I'm trying to say is that praying for them is no substitute for uh, rolling up your sleeves and going mm. to find the bread your children need. Yeah, You can do right. it on the table, but you better do it for their hearts as well. Mm. And Leanne Payne's books are very, very helpful, as is the notes that I'm trying to share with you here. Yes. Wow. There's other books uh, that are very helpful, The Gospel and the Gay and so forth. Um, so I Rogers, some of his writings. But really, Leanne Payne nails it again and again. Mm, beautiful. And this might have a pretty similar answer, but there might be a few, uh, just some slightly different thoughts for you. What, if, what would you say to the person who right now is watching this and going, wow, this is like, this has been my journey. I'm in a homosexual relationship. I'm in a homosexual lifestyle, and they're hearing this from the first time. What just thoughts that you would give them, takeaways that you give them, and next steps for someone like that? My assertion is that the choices for that that were made for that lifestyle are not free choices. They were made under duress. As a matter of fact, I don't even believe in free will. I believe in sovereignty, but free will, no. The, the will is never free. It's, it's, the will makes choices under duress from a thousand different pressure points. Here's uh, two, four, six, eight pressure points that people make same-sex decisions under. That's not free will. That's choices made under severe emotional duress. And what makes it even more uh, subtle is that there's subconscious duress. Mm. And so the sooner you can uh, identify these issues, and keeping in mind that whatever you've learned can be unlearned. There are lessons here to be unlearned according to each one of these. So my first step if you talk to me over Skype or a counselling session, if you book a session, and is going to be to take you through this diagnostic tool, find out which landmines you stood on, and then start to restore the damage by undoing the lies that sent you in the wrong direction and replacing them with truth. And uh, this is not try harder, this is the insight you never had will set you free instantly. Wow. This wow. is instantaneous being set free with an insight that your brain has never grasped wow. before. 
the truth will set you free. Wow. And <clears throat> maybe just our last <laughs> thing before we wrap this up, guys, is you often talk about king lies, which uh, just, you know, like a, a huge lie that everything else gets founded on. Uh, I am not enough. I am not enough. I am not right. I am not enough for my father to believe in me. I'm not enough for a man to love me. I'm not enough to be safe with a woman. I'm not enough. When children come to the conclusion that there's something wrong with me, I'm queer, cracked, distorted, or worthy of rejection, the stage is set for an absolute flood of lies to come into wow. your family. Through right. the permission giver, the gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. And so if that's a king lie, what's a king truth that you could just sow into everyone going forward? Uh, as God, we, uh, God created me because he needs me. Mm -hmm. And he needs me as he created me, not as I've cobbled myself together, not as I've reconstructed myself according to the pain and duress of my past. He needs me to go in search of my authentic self, not this cobbled together survival kit that I've got. Well, yeah. Fantastic. And if you want to do any more of this kind of study, mm. do come and do the uh, two week school in Nelson, New Zealand. Uh, one running in January, one running in March, April. Check the website for the dates. It's one of the most highly recommended two-week opportunities that I would I would endorse uh, Thank you, that I know about in the country. And we've had lots of our people do it. And we've had Dave Riddell uh, come and journey with us probably for the last five years, four or five years it's been. Yeah, maybe. yeah, four. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but. It's been a great journey and every single time it's been amazing, profound and powerful and so as a result a number of our, um, of our team here at our church and our school and our staff have been up to be a part of the Two Week Living Wisdom School and every time the feedback is absolutely exceptional. So if that's something that you would want to do then I would recommend that as a really, really great option. You'll join thousands of other people from all around the world who have been uh, exceptionally blessed and upgraded. You know, that's a great thing that you're talking about. You know, roll up your sleeves, go out there, do some work, and upskill yourself. This is really powerful content. So, if that's something you want to explore, you can check that out at www.livingwisdom.co.nz. Other than that, thanks everyone for joining us today, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, lots of other good content here in the embassy. And remember. If you want to have your friends and family share in this content, share in the things taking place in the embassy, it's really easy just to go to the top of the page and click on the invite button and then you can type their name into that section and you can invite your friends and family and that way they can uh, get a hold of this content. But I want to really encourage you with this message to pass it on, to spread it around, to get people uh, eyes on it. So if you know a friend who needs to see this, add them into the embassy, tag their name on it and let's, uh, let's see some amazing freedom taking place for people. And we want to thank Benji for doing what he's doing. Eh? He's doing a great job. Mm. A great job. Mate. Keep it up. Thank you very much, sir. Well, bless you guys, and we'll see you again very soon. Have a great day. Ciao.